So I'm going to hit the recording. Welcome, everybody. Excited to have you in class today. My name is Curry Sotner. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the National Constitution Center, and I'm super excited to have you all here today. This has been an entire month where we dive into the topic of the First Amendment. Last week, we dove into free speech, and today we're going to look at the First Amendment and kind of laser focus in on religion clauses. And we'll probably talk a lot about a lot of religion cases as well. Now, in the First Amendment, there's two clauses that focus on religion. We'll look at both. Um, but we're really excited because we get to bring in one of our VIP special scholars. So let me introduce you to Professor Francis Gramley, who goes by Gramley, who's with us today. He is Brett for Professor at, formerly professor at of political science at St. Jonas University. And Professor Lee, we are so excited to have you today. And I was really super interested. I have, you know, talked to the Rendell Center. You have worked on teacher workshops with us and with others for years. It's been fantastic to have you. And your area of specialty is really looking at these religion clauses as well as a few others. So as we dive in and we wait for Jeff Rosen, who's coming in right now to join us, I think I'm going to kick it off with a question that one of our students sure. um, asked before class started. And that was, can you help me understand what is the separation of church and state and how does that really work? Hi, Jeff. Welcome. As you come in as well, I figured we'd get us started talking about church and state and what is that separation and the religion causes. And then we'll kick it back over to you. Okay. Well, the, the idea of separation of church and state, it's kind of funny. It's not the words from the Constitution. It's like separation of powers we all talk about. But you start looking at the Constitution, it's always good to read the Constitution. You're not going to find separation of powers, and you're not going to find separation between church and state. It's a, it's a phrase, the, the latter is a phrase that comes from Thomas Jefferson. And what the dimensions of that wall are, uh, they keep changing. And the construction of the wall or the security of the wall uh, keeps it varies dramatically. I know. And that, I think, is why people find it so unique and confusing, because it feels like a moving target. So let's kick this off by looking at that First Amendment. And I'm going to turn it over to Jeff Rosen, our president and CEO, to welcome and to lead the question. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Curry. And welcome, Professor Lee. It's such an honor to have you talk to our students. And we're so looking forward to learning with you. Uh, well, you're so right that it's important to read the text of the Constitution and um, to begin with the words. So why don't we call up uh, on the screen the, the text of the religion clauses of the First Amendment, and we'll read them. And you can, you can help us give us a sort of Constitution 101 primer. So when we look on the, on the interactive constitution, uh, which is right here, we have the um, two clauses that we're gonna be talking about today, the establishment clause and the free exercise clause. We'll just read the text. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Before we separate those two clauses out, tell us broadly what the founders were trying to achieve when they passed the religion clauses of the First Amendment. Well, that's much too hard a question to ask me what they were trying to achieve. I mean, I'm not a psycho psychoanalyst. I, I teach political science. I, I think when you look at the language, you have to be very careful to read that language exactly, because you could, if you change a, put a little article in of a religion, you change that first clause or first phrase tremendously. Uh, clearly, they wanted to protect religious liberty. Now, some people have said subsequently, well, there's a tension between the free exercise phrase or free exercise clause and the establishment clause. Well, that can't be. We can't say that the framers of the Bill of Rights or James Madison were, were goofy, that they didn't, they, they didn't realize there would be a conflict. The goal is religious liberty. I think Justice Breyer uh, said it most eloquently. The purpose was to prevent discord based on religion and to protect the religious liberty of people based on their different faiths. That, that, was the, that was the goal. Wonderful, thank you so much for that. That's uh, very helpful to invoke Justice Breyer. Well, let's see what our two scholars from the um, Interactive Constitution have said about the Establishment Clause. This is Michael McConnell and, and Marcy Hamilton, two of America's leading scholars of the Establishment Clause. And they described the history of the clause. Uh, we'll just read it together saying that America's early settlers came from a variety of religious backgrounds. During colonial times, the Church of England was established by law. In other words, uh, you had to pay 
tithing or support to the established church of Puritan or Congregationalist churches in New England or the uh, Anglican church in um, of, of the South in Virginia. After independence, there was widespread agreement that there could be no nationally established church. The establishment clause of the First Amendment, principally authored by James Madison, reflects this consensus. The language applies only to the federal government, but all states disestablishment religion by 1833. In the 1940s, the Supreme Court has upheld it to the states. And here's the consensus that the, our scholars say, virtually all jurists agree that it would violate the establishment clause for the government to compel attendance or financial support of a religious institution as such, for the government to interfere with a religious organization's selection of clergy or religious doctrine, for religious organizations or figures to exercise government power, or for the government to extend benefits to some religious entities without adequate secular justification. That was the consensus of our, our scholars. Do you, do you agree with that? And what, what can you add to that uh, observation? Well, certainly, and was the federal government, uh, as a New Englander, I, I remember seeing churches the first Unitarian church founded in 1625, which is amazing since Unitarianism doesn't start for about another hundred years. New England or Massachusetts, they were an established church, I think it's to the early 1830s that the, uh, every village, could, every town would, would vote on the minister and uh, the Unitarians started winning some elections in the 1820s. So the, the Congregationalists decided this idea of an established church wasn't a, a great idea. So. Uh, it, it, originally, it only limits the, the federal government. With Everson versus Board of Education, the Establishment Clause is incorporated onto the, the states, in the case of Everson versus Board of Education of Ewing Township. Some people wondered whether uh, that really makes, state, makes sense. Is it a liberty? Is non-establishment a liberty? Or, well, that never, never was debated. No one uh, in Everson versus Board of Edu Education, everyone kind of accepted it was a liberty. Uh, it's such an important observation, and it's absolutely true that the core of the Establishment Clause comes from the idea of freedom or liberty of conscience. And there's a wonderful passage by James Madison in his uh, Memorial Against Religious Assessments, where he's talking about why it would violate the Constitution as well as natural law to force you to support a church that you didn't actually agree with. And I'm going to read uh, Madison's beautiful language because it's so... Uh, memorable. Uh, Madison is talking about freedom of conscience, and he says that this right is in its nature an unalienable right, because the opinions of men, depending only on the evidence contemplated by their own minds, cannot follow the dictates of other men. In other words, I can't surrender to you or to Curry the power to control my thoughts, because my opinions depend only on the evidence contemplated by my own mind, and I have to think for myself. Um, tell us about that natural law foundation of the freedom of conscience. I think it's important to emphasize, Madison, we talk about Jefferson and the, the wall of separation. Jefferson, certainly, whether he was a deist or what, how, what his attitudes were about religion, certainly saw religion as a threat. Madison doesn't. Uh, Madison's there to protect religious liberty, and as you point out, religious conscience. That the people, uh, the government should be neutral, that, the, that religion should rise or fall on its own not interfered with by government, not supported by government, uh, true faith will, will win out and false faith won't, and the government should, should play no role. So his views, uh, and he's the person who's there at that first Congress writing the Bill of Rights. Thomas Jefferson tends to be you know, mentioned a lot, but he's always out of town, I guess, finding out how to uh, grow better wine, grow better grapes and have French wine. Thanks so much for that. Well, Victoria asks, um, how many of the founders shared the same religion and how many uh, different religious beliefs were held by the framers? It's a great question, Victoria. I'm in the middle of having the pleasure of reading Jefferson and Madison and Franklin and Adams and all of them trying to understand their understanding of the pursuit of happiness, which they understood as pursuing virtue, not feeling good, but being good. And in the course of reading the primary text, I, I've gotten a clearer sense than I had before of their different religious beliefs. So just some things I've learned recently. Franklin came very strongly to believe in a providential God, as well as the afterlife. And at the end of the Constitutional Convention, he implores the Almighty to sort of guide the future of America. John Adams is a pretty robust Christian um, who also believes in providence and, and afterlife, although he sometimes was skeptical about the details of um, 
uh, Puritan uh, uh, doctrine. Um, Jefferson says repeatedly that he believes um, in an afterlife and in the divinity. He does not believe in the divinity of Jesus Christ, and he famously annotates the Bible so that it takes out the miracles, and it's sort of the rationalist Bible. But he takes scissors to it, I think, doesn't it? He does. It's a wonderful thing, and it's great to read his nice it's, job. It's it's absolutely. But he's very much uh, a believer in in the divinity, which is why uh, he says in the Declaration, "We are endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights." So it's it's easy to um, mistake. Uh, the rejection of some of the framers in different ways of the, the um, particular requirements of uh, the Bible, in particular the divinity of Christ and the miracles, with their not believing in an Almighty. Uh, Jefferson, although more of a deist, uh, was still uh, did believe in a divinity. And then there's a range um, of of others as well. Benjamin Rush is is one of the most devout Christians, and John Quincy Adams is is quite uh, religious too. It's exciting to see that their faith, which took different forms, was consistent with a deep belief in toleration. And one of the most important of the sources that inspired the religion clauses was John Locke's essay concerning toleration which talks about the urgent importance for people to make up their own minds and not to be forced to support churches that they don't support. Because first of all, there's no point in making people swear allegiance to stuff they don't believe in. And also it's the violation of their natural rights. Uh, Professor Lee, to tell us about that sort of deep commitment to religious tolerance. I, I think in terms of the background of the people that whether at the Constitutional Convention or at the First Congress, uh, they come right after the religious, religious revival, uh, the Methodists. Uh, that sweeps America in the, in the 1750s. And indeed, some say it's one of the causes of the American Revolution, that uh, this re revival of religion, uh, Britain was seen, or the king and, and England as corrupt, as morally corrupt. Uh, the group that comes in terms of religion are, are overwhelmingly Protestant. I, you know, th there is the, the crew from, from Maryland, the Carols, who are Catholic. Uh, but otherwise, it's overwhelmingly a Protestant group. But there are these, as you point out, a variety of Protestants. And, uh, and so no one, while the New England is very happy to have the established church, and some Episcopalians are very happy, despite the efforts of Madison and Jefferson with it, was going to stop them, to have the Episcopal churches established. No one wants the federal government involved in this. They clearly realize that would be yet another uh, cause of discord. So they want religious liberty, uh, not just as a natural right, but maybe you could say in good old Madisonian language, but out of their own self-interest, that no one's going to interfere with what they're doing in South Carolina or in, or in Massachusetts or in Connecticut. Or in Pennsylvania, where there was, was far more religious tolerance and liberty than in the other colonies or the other states. Absolutely. Um, very, very important uh, observations. This is a bit of a sort of extra credit uh, um, detail, but I've, there's a fun word that uh, I remember learning when I studied for the SATs long ago, and that is anti-disestablishmentarianism. And <laughs> disestablishmentarianism was opposition uh, or rather disestablishmentarianism was a desire to disestablish uh, state churches, the ones you were talking about, which persisted in New England until the 1820s. Some, like, like Justice Clarence Thomas, say that the Establishment Clause was an, uh, it was an uh, anti-disestablishment provision. It was designed to prevent the federal government from disestablishing the state churches, but it wasn't intended to uh, forbid the states from uh, imposing religious establishments. Uh, what do you think of that kind of esoteric but interesting debate? Well, I think on that point, at that, if you're talking about the time when the First Amendment was proposed and ratified, clearly that was one of the goals. The question is, with the adoption of the 14th Amendment, uh, does that change the whole game? Does that apply that part of the Bill of Rights onto the states that you now read the First Amendment the earlier topics for this session were on the other issues of the First Amendment, that it isn't simply that Congress can make no law, but the states may make no law, or the creatures of the states, municipalities, cities, and townships. Absolutely. That, that's so important to remember that it is the question of whether after the 14th Amendment, um, the states are also bound to respect the Establishment Clause. Linda asks a really important question. She says, it seems the founders did not want to impose religious dogma or doctrine on anyone. And that is one of the sources for supporting freedom of conscience. 
we seem to be living in a time when tolerance has lost out to what's called evangelical churches and belief systems. Is there a current, current attempt to establish a certain religion? Well, Linda, that of, that of course is such a uh, important question. It's at the center of many of the disputes that the Supreme Court is hearing right now. What constitutes an establishment of religion? And to answer that, we have to see what the Supreme Court has said. And one of the things that the court said, which is next up on our interactive constitution explainer here is the lemon test. And I'm gonna read it. And before I do, I have to note that there's a lot of skepticism about this test on the Supreme Court today. So it's not um, uncontestedly uh, accepted. But here the lemon test says, uh, gives us three factors for deciding whether a government practice violates the establishment clause. First, the statute has to have a secular legislative purpose. Second, its principal or primary effect must be one that neither advances nor inhibits religion. Finally, the statute must not foster an excessive entanglement with religion. Professor Lee, that, that is indeed a contested test. Justice Scalia talked about Lemon rising from the grave like the ghoul in a horror movie and obviously wanted to overturn it. But tell us about the Lemon test. What does it mean and why is it so controversial today? Well, it's, it's wonderful uh, for students who don't want to read an entire Supreme Court opinion because all you have to do is read the first paragraph and if Lemon is mentioned, uh, you know the law is going to be struck down as unconstitutional. And if you go a page or two without Lemon being mentioned, I mean, this is kind of, I don't want to tell students that they shouldn't read the entire text, but I think they, a lot of times I don't need to encourage them not to read it all. But if you don't see Lemon mentioned the first two, two pages, you probably, they're going to say that this, the law is constitutional. It doesn't violate the Establishment Clause. It's one of these precedents that it is, if you're talking about the Establishment Clause, it is the precedent. And yet uh, it doesn't seem to have much effect. Uh, basically, Justice O'Connor and Justice Kennedy added their little test to it. Uh, O'Connor saying, does the law endorse religion? Uh, if it does, if it sends an imprimatur, this, this religion is better than, than others or better than no religion, that's a violation of the Establishment Clause. And Kennedy takes the position, well, if it doesn't coerce, then it isn't a violation of the Establishment Clause. If it is coercive, such as a, a prayer at a baccalaureate service, Lee versus Weissman, then it's unconstitutional. So here we've got this precedent, uh, which doesn't seem to have much effect. It doesn't, it, it's brought out as Scalia says, when they wanna strike something down. And if they don't wanna strike it down, uh, they're gonna allow chaplains in state legislatures. Uh, you don't talk about lemon and it's okay. So it's a precedent, but it isn't a precedent. Thank you very much for summarizing the law so well. And as you say, there have been a series of other tests proposed uh, to Lemon, and, and they come up in often in the context of government-sponsored religious symbols. And this is a very hot topic, friends. Uh, today, of course, can the government uh, put up uh, creches and crosses and the Ten Commandments and all that sort of stuff? And here, our scholars tell us that the most prominent test for evaluating public displays of religion is called the endorsement test, whether a reasonable observer acquainted with the full context would regard the display as the government endorsing religion and sending a message of disenfranchisement to believers and non-believers. And this often is close, and we hear about the Lynch case involving a nativity scene with other holiday decorations, the city of Allegheny, which was a nativity scene in a courthouse, and then more recently, uh, we just had the um, uh, Ten Commandments cases um, involving a big Ten Commandments monument. Um, Professor Lee, is, is the endorsement test basically the law of the land right now? And how should our students think about how the current Supreme Court evaluates religious displays in public? It, it certainly seems. I mean, this is O'Connor's contribution is this idea of, of endorsement. Does it send a message uh, that excludes some people and puts some people uh, at a higher level? And so when you look at the uh, the facts in terms of the, the Allegheny County, it was a, a crush scene, an activity scene. I think they had poinsettia plants around it. It, it clearly was the center of attention. Whereas Lynch versus Donnelly, uh, I'm a New Englander, you know, this is, comes from Rogue Island. Uh, this is a plastic baby Jesus, reindeers, Donald Duck, Mickey Mouse, they're all together. Uh, that's okay. So uh, however tasteless it is, that makes it okay. And if it sends the endorsement as the, as the uh, thing in Allegheny County, that's not. Of course, you get the more controversial other case where the menorah is held not to be religious by the same Supreme Court, uh, which 
cause some people would see it as, as problematic to say it isn't a religious symbol. Uh, the more recent cases, you say the Ten Commandments, uh, it's one thing that what, I forget that what's one of the, the one of the southern states where the chief justice had a uh, marble of granite, I guess, uh, Ten Commandments brought in and plunk. That goes too far. With Van Orden, you've got the Ten Commandments with a lot of other uh, statuary around it. Kind of similar to what the, the case the Supreme Court has from, from Boston, where the city of Boston has apparently three flagpoles, uh, one with the Commonwealth flag, one with the US flag, and then the city flag. And every so often, you can put up another flag on the city flag. And there's been basically everything's gone up and it goes up for a day. And some Christian group wanted something with a flag with, with a cross. And some municipal employer said, no, that, that would violate the establishment clause or the question that one of the students asked earlier, that would violate the concept of separation between church and state. That was recently argued before the court. And I think it's pretty clear uh, that the city of Boston is gonna lose by a fairly uh, large vote. It, uh, uh, I'm not totally a betting man. I don't want to bet my poor pension, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if the city of Boston is going to lose nine to zip. Yes, I, I, I'll, I'll, that, that does seem like a good prediction. Um, in the Boston case, as you said, many of the justices seem, seem to think it was a mistake for the city of Boston to refuse this ceremonial uh, city hall flag raising to a Christian group when it had never turned down a similar request from any other organization, the justices asked all sorts of follow-up questions. What about a request from um, other groups uh, to raise flags? And um, as a result, this shows us that this, many of these religion cases are not divided on five to four lines, but that uh, there's consensus among the justices. Justice Gorsuch said, if the official made a mistake about the so-called separation of church and state, why doesn't that resolve this case? Um, in the context of a system where flags go up, flags go down, different people have different kinds of flags, said Justice Kagan, then it's a violation of the free speech part of the First Amendment, right. and not an establishment clause violation, the end. I think uh, this is better to keep the city's flag up there. It looks very nice. Uh, Otherwise, they're going to have more problems. Very, very much so. Well, I think that leads us to the uh, free exercise clause, and we just have a little bit of... Uh, Time, but why don't we put that on the table if we go to the um, interactive constitution uh, and go back to the free exercise clause. Let's see what our scholars have to say. This is Professor McConnell and Frederick Geddes, and they talk about the inalienable rights that we've already talked about and, and note that James Madison said in, in uh, that it is the duty of every man to render unto the creator such homage and such only as he believes to be acceptable to him. This duty is precedent both in order of time and degree of obligation to the claims of civil society. Friends, once again, you can see Madison embracing this idea of natural rights and saying, before we form governments, all of us have not only this right, but this duty to think for ourselves, to decide what we believe and don't believe. And we that that's precedent to our forming uh, civil society. Then our scholars say, that there were early questions involving the Mormons and whether or not uh, attempts to suppress polygamy interfered with their free exercise of religion. And in the Reynolds case, the court said, uh, laws are made for the government of actions. And while they cannot interfere with mere belief and opinion, they may with practice. So Reynolds did say there's a difference between thought and practice and upheld restrictions on polygamy. But say our scholars, this ignored the free exercise clause is obvious protection of religious practice. And today there's much more protection for practice and many uh, things that uh, infringe religious practice are evaluated under so-called uh, strict scrutiny. And this is, I'm piling a lot in here, friends. And I'd like you to read this more um, closely, but I'm going to tee up and Professor Lee asked you about this very important debate the Supreme Court is having right now about whether or not to overturn the Employment Division versus Smith case, which held that the Free Exercise Clause does not relieve an individual of the obligation to comply with a valid and neutral law of general applicability on the ground the law prescribes or prescribes conduct that his religion prescribes or proscribes. That's a pretty tough sentence to unpack, but basically what was going on in Smith is that uh, Native Americans who used peyote as part of their practices wanted to have an exemption from the 
laws that say you can't use drugs. They said, this is part of our practice. And the Supreme Court said, no, the, dr lo the drug laws apply to everyone. They're not targeting Native this Native American group. And generally, you don't get to have an exemption from generally applicable laws. Professor Lee, that, that, that Smith case is hotly contested. Some have called for it to be overruled. What's the controversy about it? And, and uh, what, what do you think the court's gonna do? In terms of a, of a case for people who believe in free exercise, it was the worst case to come up at the time that, that came up. I mean, you just had Nancy Reagan a few years before saying, just say no. Uh, Smith and Black, the, the two individuals who were using peyote, at least one of them was a drug counselor. So, I mean, the idea that you're going to have a drug counselor using uh, category one or standard one drug, it's, it's, it's an awful case to have. But it also came in the wake of a whole series of cases where the quote really wasn't very sympathetic to free exercise. I mean, Sherbert versus Vanna, the Brennan decision from the, the, from the Warren Court was probably the, the first time that the court really strongly protected free exercise of religion on its own. I mean, the earlier cases that where religious groups won, they could have won uh, not based on, on the free exercise clause, but on free speech. Campwell versus Connecticut being a good example of that. Uh, so between Sherbert versus Vann in 1965 and Employment Division versus Smith, they claim the court claims it's using the compelling state interest test, but it seems pretty easy for government to pass that was well, supposedly, uh, usually, uh, certainly in terms of equal protection, a very high standard. And so uh, Native Americans lose. I mean, the government's going to drive, put a put a road through their what they see as sacred graveyard. The road goes through. The government says that's fine. Uh, another group of Indians they don't they believe that giving a number to someone takes away her soul. So they say, no, you have to have a social security number. I'm old enough to remember you didn't have to have social security numbers for juveniles. So compelling state interest gets watered down. And Scalia in this case, pretty much I'd say buries it. Uh, but the reaction to, to the Employment Division versus Smith is the enactment of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act and subsequently the Religious Land Use and Institutionalist uh, Persons Act where Congress comes to the defense of free exercise. And what we've seen there, seen since then is kind of a flip-flop. Usually you'd say with the liberals like William Brennan, probably the greatest justice, I would say of the 20th century, certainly a liberal uh, who protects free exercise and the conservatives uh, who don't, and his Scalia not protecting it too much. What's happened since uh, employment diversion versus Smith, it's almost like the, the, the two sides have switched the, uh, their, their playbook. And with the cases, it tends to be the more conservative judges, now the Republican judges who support free exercise and some of the liberal judges who, who are not very supportive of free exercise. And that, you know, the, the confirmation for replacement for Breyer, Justice Breyer has been one uh, who's been the most swing justice on this issue, Kagan and, and Breyer, who uh, tend to take a middle position between the Sotomayor and uh, the late Justice Ginsburg, who tend to be quite unsympathetic to free exercise, and then the, the Gorsuches and the Alitos, who tend to be very supportive. We don't know how long employment division will, will survive. Some thought it was going to fall last year with the case from Philadelphia involving Catholic social services and the adoption agencies. Uh, it didn't. The court found a way to rule in favor of Catholic social services, again by nine to zero, and leave employment division there. Absolutely. And that um, perfectly tees up a, a question from our, our friend Colin Thibault, who says, how do you think the court's decision in the Catholic social services case will affect future cases? Or is it a one-time thing? It seems to be a one-time thing. Well, the way they did it, they, they found a, a little provision. They, they had two options. I, I thought they were going to use something very similar to what they had done in the case involving uh, Masterpiece Bakery where they found the uh, Colorado Civil Rights Commission had basically an animus against religion. I, I rather thought, as someone living outside Philadelphia, that the behavior of the, the current mayor, Mayor Kenny, and his relationship with the, with the Catholic Archbishop, they don't get along, or they didn't get along at all. And, and Kenny was quite critical that they would use that as, as, a, as a way of, of of basically cabining the decision and keeping it fairly limited. They found a, a, a provision in, this, in the city ordinance of exceptions, and they said that that was got nine of them to go along. But clearly, uh, Gorsuch and Alito want employment division overturned. Uh, uh, Justice Kerry Barrett uh, doesn't know what to replace it with. But I think uh, employment division versus Smith 
is not wrong for this world. Thank you for that. And I'm gonna ask one last question before turning it back to Curry. And that is that, uh, uh, tell us about the Carson and Macon case, which you've called the most important of this term. What's going on in that well, case? It's and what most important because it's gonna have widespread effects, even though it comes out of a very unusual situation that's, uh, I don't know whether any of some of the Western states or the mountain states have the same situation, but in Maine and, and New Hampshire, you have lots of areas where there are not a lot of people, some schools. And so certain uh, school districts or certain towns have decided, no, they're not going to have a high school. They can't afford one. And so what they came up with was a deal that uh, a certain amount of money would be used that you could take, send your son or daughter to high school. Could be a public school in, in Bangor or Portland, or, or it could be a private school. Uh, for people who are commuting from home or working from home, and you want to send your son or daughter to Phillips Exit or Andover Academy, uh, and you're in a district where there is no school, they will give you $13,000 toward your tuition, we'll pay the whole thing, at, at, or Episcopal Academy, since we come to Philadelphia, uh, you can take send your child there, you need a boarding school, obviously. Uh, it's an odd operation. At one time, religious schools were part of it. Uh, then they decided, no, they shouldn't be part of it. And so some religious schools tried to become less religious. Uh, one of the Jesuit school in Bangor tried that rule. They said the student wasn't qual weren't qualified. Uh, so you now have parents who want to send their child to a very religious school saying, look, we should get the money. If you're not giving the money to us, that is discrimination. That's a violation of our free exercise. You, you, the court has said that you cannot deny a Lutheran church uh, state money to, to pave the, the uh, playground with soft stuff so the kids don't hurt themselves. You've, you've said to the state of Montana that you've got a scholarship program. You can't cut uh, kids going to religious schools out of it. That's constitutional. And so the question is, would, would this require the state of Maine to send money to these schools? And again, given the, the present makeup of the court, uh, I, I think you're going to find the court saying yes, uh, not by 9-0. And it will have a dramatic effect because now you're, you're saying the free exercise clause can be used against states that believe that giving aid to religion violates the establishment clause, either the federal constitution or their own, or their own uh, Blaine amendments, the many Blaine amendments which states have. So it will have dramatic consequences because it could force, let's say, uh, in Philadelphia or in a city with charter schools, where the charter schools are, are limited to non-religious, that you could see the parochial schools, the Catholic schools or, or Christian schools or, or Jewish day schools saying, look, we're doing the same thing as charter schools. You're funding them. You should fund us. Fascinating. That, that really does help us understand the stakes. And as you say, until now, that the court has allowed uh, voucher money to go to secular or religious schools as long as it's parental choice rather than state decision that determines the ultimate destination of the funds. But this would be a change because it would say that when state programs make funds directly available to secular schools, they also have to go to religious schools, even to fund religious activities, which is a line yep. that it was not um, made before. And that would be a a huge change, as you as you say. Um, well, thank you so much for setting up the stakes of that case so well. And Curry, back to you for just a few final questions. Thank you. And that was perfect because so many, Vicki and Kathy, were asking about that aid um, to religious schools because that's a part of the uh, clauses that really kind of grapple with people's brains and are trying to figure out how this works. Now, a couple other questions. I loved Ryan's question in the Q and A. Um, he wanted to understand. Is there an interpretation in these clauses about freedom from religion? So we so often talk about freedom of religion and your right to have your own religion and all these things. But he wanted to know, you know, from the founding generation to modern, what is the question around freedom from religion? Well, well certainly, uh, uh, if some religious people come to my door and, and want to proselytize me, uh, I can slam the door at them and probably tell them to, well, since they believe in hell, to where they could go. Uh, so there's that. Uh, 
you, you certainly can't have religious organizations coming into public schools and uh, handing out Bibles. Uh, that would be clearly a violent, I think all the justices would agree with that. Uh, the, the other case that, that might touch on this is the, the, the case involving the uh, football coach uh, who, who has prayers, not just at the end of the game, uh, but before, uh, I, I, that I think would be a case of where you've got, you need freedom from religion, that the idea uh, that he's doing that, uh, I would be surprised if that's upheld. I mean, while the court has changed dramatically on free exercise and establishment, and as I pointed out, Lemon and, and Employment Division seems to be basically shadows of themselves, I'd be surprised if a majority of the court would 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 go along with the, this guy Kennedy. Uh, they've been stronger uh, in terms of protecting religion from interfering in the public schools. That the public schools should stay secular. And we have been talking about this all weekend, really talking to our students about public schools and in school and students, and then looking at that in government buildings or in courthouses or in community centers. And it's that. Age does pay a factor here, and the courts are looking at that differently, and we should think about that and understand that differently. Now, Kip had a question around the history of adding in the words under God to the Pledge of Allegiance. And I thought, you know, as he's thinking about the modern questions about removing or adding under God to conventions or to the Pledge of Allegiance, could you tell us a little backstory of that um, addition to the Pledge of Allegiance and even on the coins? Under God comes uh, right after the Second World War. Uh, America becomes a lot more religious. I mean, whether they say there's, there's no atheists in foxholes, we become more religious. Uh, it's pushed by the, uh, the Eisenhower administration. The Knights of Columbus, a Catholic fraternal organization, plays a major role in adding this. Uh, it's, it's, they've made efforts to get it to the court before. I think there was one coming out of New Hampshire. Uh, the Supreme Court seems to not want to pick it up. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. again, self-interest, uh, you know, is it, how important? Uh, you, you've got under God, in God we trust, on the coinage. Uh, I, I doubt the justices of any persuasion want to get involved in this one. But, yeah, and that's the other kind of like... But I think I, I, I think I'll bet some of the money that has in God we, tr on God, in God we trust that they aren't going to do it. Yeah, we were talking about this all week, like this balance between place and religion and understanding how it changes with the court's decisions, but also that that kind of mixing and balance between tradition um, as well as religion I and in I place. Like chaplains who are paid. I mean, I don't know how you can, if you believe in church-state separation or you believe in the non-establishment clause, how you can accept it. Yeah, one, and lots of questions. One thing to have chaplains in the military. But to have chaplains in Congress, I can't believe it's constitutional. But they're not. The court is not ready to do that. Uh, I have a lot of courage, but the Congress, but they can't get me. I'm unimportant. It's good. <laughs> um, so all week long, we've been talking about this and how these are really, uh, you know, a lot of five four split decisions. And you said that earlier. It, it's not going to be nine zero. And it. Uh, great topic for our students to kind of watch the courts this year. There's two major cases and keep an eye on it. And I just actually wrap up confirmation because Justice Breyer's position, as I said, Breyer and Kagan are kind of in between on these issues. And so it's kind of interesting that in the recent confirmation battles, church state issues haven't come up. I mean, they haven't been talking about Bible reading as, as much as they used to, or Bible pra practices, public schools. But the question is, with, uh, re with uh, a replacement for Breyer, uh, there's been some focus on the, uh, the Judge uh, Kruger from California with her position on free exercise when she was working in the US Solicitor General's office. And her position seems to be quite different from the position that Justice Kagan takes or that Justice Breyer traditionally took on free exercise cases. And I love that because we do assign Jeff work in this class all the time. So that's what our students will have to do this weekend. And I just wanted to thank you so much, but also wrap up with a great line you said earlier 
Um, the founding generation wanted to leave religion to rise and fall on its own merits. And I really found that as an interesting way to think about it, that it's your choice your brain, your mind, your thoughts, and that is something that you can express. So thank you so much for joining us for class today. Kind of unpacking this teach really without a mask, area. Too, that's even better. <laughs> thank you so much, Jeff. Thank you so much for chiming in and pulling us through. And the students have a ton of reading with that interactive constitution too. <laughs> thank, thank you so much, Professor Lee. It was wonderful to learn with you. Thank you, friends, and have a great weekend all. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye.